Well, this morning I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to talk uh, to you about a, a very uh, common phrase that we use on a fairly regular basis. Um, every one of us in our life have probably said this a time or two. I'm not speaking just to the college graduates this morning or just to the high school graduates or the middle school graduates, um, but as I was preparing uh, for this morning, they were definitely on my heart. Um, but, you know, every one of us, whether, you know, we're, we're older in age, whether we're senior citizens or whether we're, you know, in high school and uh, whether, you know, we're married in life or wherever we're at, all of us at one point or another, we get to this point where we are at a fork in the road. And as we stand in this place, we have to make a decision where we're going to go in life. As I said earlier, you, you might be a married couple, and maybe your relationship is struggling and you're facing divorce. There's a fork in the road. Maybe you're a young person, and you know, you're in a dating relationship, and that relationship isn't going so well. Or maybe it's going too well, and you're at a fork in the road. You have to make a decision. Maybe you're a college graduate, maybe you're a high school graduate, and you're making a decision. All of us at one point or another in life, we face this moment, a fork in the road, and we have to ask ourselves this question. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Which choice do I make? Which step do I take? Which direction do I turn? Where do we go from here? This is going to be our topic this morning. If you're taking notes, go ahead and just write that at the top of your paper. Where do we go from here? Maybe you're on your iOS device or your Android or Windows phone. Just open up the notepad, take some notes this morning, jot down some scripture because this is one of those words from God that we don't want to walk out of here and forget. We need to remember this. And so as we do, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 13. If you have your Bible this morning, I encourage you to open it up to Genesis chapter 13. You know, the other day, my wife and I, uh, we had some, some time alone. If you have children here in the house, you know exactly how precious that is. Time alone with your spouse is like, where, what, what is that? I mean, what does that even mean? I just don't even know what to call that. We had some time alone. I was thankful for, <laughs> this sounds bad. I was thankful for mom and dad. They took the kids for a little bit and uh, hung out with them. And Stella and I, we decided, you know, we're going we're gonna to head out. We're going to grab some food. We're going to go out to eat. And so I, I got home and I said, you know, wh where do you want to go? Well, I don't know. Okay. You guys are laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was like, well, let's see here. We could go to Hales, or, you know, maybe we could, we could go to Stockman's, you know. Um, hey, maybe we could do a taste of Thai. I just don't know. You know, I want Thai, but I don't feel like I want it. What's that even mean? I just, I want it, but I don't know if I want it. You know, it's, it's I don't know, whatever happens up here inside of a girl's mind, it, you know, it's like this matrix with nodes everywhere. It's like, I can't even follow the roadmap. So it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe we can hit up Sherry's, you know, or maybe we could hit up, you know, and, oh, I don't know. So eventually we get in the car, okay? This takes a while, but we get in the car. We're actually turning the engine on at this moment, okay? This is itty bitty baby steps here. So we get in, we turn the car on, and I head out forth, I head out, you know, to Elm, and I'm hitting here on the Elm and 395, right there. You got McDonald's there, and you got El Tapatio and Starbucks. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Right over there. And I'm like, which way should I turn? Honey, I've got to turn. Which way should I turn? Well, I just don't know what I want. Okay, so finally I take a blind leap of faith, okay? And I turn left, and we're heading down, and I'm going about 25 miles an hour down the road because I know... There are several restaurants coming up, and I don't want that moment where it's like, do a you know, quick U-turn, and we got to turn back around. I don't want that. So I'm driving about 25 miles an hour, nearly get rear-ended by a semi, who passes me eating a hamburger, okay? <laughs> that may not have really happened, but okay. So anyways, we're heading along 25 miles an hour, and it's like, do you, honey, honey, we're, we're coming up here to where we could turn off for... 
taste of Thai. Do you want Thai? I don't know. Okay, well, that one's gone. Okay, well, there goes Walker's Steakhouse. You want, no? Okay, well, that one's gone. Okay, finally, it's like, I'm just going to turn into Sherry's because we have to make a decision. Guys, this is what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about? A fork in the road. Sometimes we just have to make a decision. We've got to turn one way or we've got to turn the other. You can't keep going straight. I lived in Portland for a while, and I saw a guy who did not take the fork in the road, and his car crashed into the median. So we don't want that to happen in life because it's very dangerous, okay? The fork in the road forces us to make a decision. And here in Genesis chapter 13, a man named Abraham is at a fork in the road. God calls him. He says, Abraham, at that time his name was Abram, I am calling you for something great. And he says, Abram, you need to leave. You need to leave this land. And you need to go. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. You are going to be prosperous. Your name will be famous for all the rest of the generations. They will be talking about you, Abram. But go. Go. I can kind of imagine, you know, this, this moment between God and Abram. God, where am I going? Just go. Okay. Well, I got my tom-tom. I'm a donkey. You got a GPS setting for me? Just go. Any directions. Like anything. I mean... God, can, can I get some of those, like, you know, redneck hillbilly directions, like turn left at the apple tree or, you know, go past the only stoplight in town and, and, you know, anything, God, anything. Go past the big rock. It's painted red. You'll notice it. You can't miss it. Anything. Just go. You'll know when you get there. Yeah, okay. That's about as frustrating as where do we go eat, you know. Okay, well, God, I'll just go. I'll just go. I'll just get on the donkey, and I'll just go. I'll just head out, and hopefully when I get there, I know what it's like, you know. So Abraham, he heads out with a promise. No directions, but he's got a promise. He doesn't know where he's going, but he's got a promise from God. Now, with that kind of a promise, I'm going to make you great. You're going to be famous. Your descendants are going to be like the sand of the sea. That's almost kind of scary. That one makes me a little nervous. But I imagine as he's heading out, he's got time to think about this. This promise from God. I'm going to be famous. Wow. I'm going to be, I'm going to be great. greatness you know I bet where I'm going I bet there's a city you know it's kind of hard to be great in the middle of nowhere it's kind of hard to be famous you know when there's like nobody around well I guess you could be famous to yourself I bet it's a city you know I I bet it's a city amongst other cities as a matter of fact you know I could be I could be a leader of leaders. As he strokes his beard, I could be a leader of leaders. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm looking for a city. Okay, where's a city? And he starts and he heads out and he's thinking. I imagine he had time to think about this. But as Abraham arrives at his location, we find that he's actually faced with a fork in the road. As he arrives, the Bible tells us that Lot went with him. And he's taking all of their possessions. Both Lot and Abram both had livestock. They had families. The Bible tells us that Abraham had over 300 men that traveled with him. They were part of his herdsmen, caretakers of the land, They're traveling with a lot of stuff. And here in verse 
chapter 8 of Genesis chapter 13. Now let's go ahead and go to that slide and we can look at it together. The Bible gives us some very interesting information. Genesis chapter 13, verses 8. Please, let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen since we are relatives. This is Abraham and Lot talking. They are nephews and they're in this land but it's too small for both of them to stay together. Verse 9, isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Heading on over to verse 13, or uh, verses uh, 10. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men, they parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. What can we learn from this? What can God teach us from this short passage of scripture about how to deal with life when we've got a fork in the road? The first is this, and if you're taking notes, go ahead and write this down. We learn and understand that our direction determines our destiny. You won't want to forget this. Your direction determines your destiny. Two relatives both with a lot of livestock, a lot of money, a lot of possessions, a lot of people. They can't reside in the same place, so they're faced with this fork in the road, and Abram and Lot have to decide which way they're going to go. Abraham says, if you turn left, I'll turn right. If you turn right, I'll turn left. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Just pick one direction. Let's separate company. Let's part company. You go, and I'll go the opposite direction. Interestingly enough, we've got two places that they go. Lot eventually ends up making his home in Sodom. But he puts his herd and his tent in the Jericho Valley. Abram turns and he puts his in Canaan. This is a land that for over the last, over the last 200 years has been in a decline. It used to be very popular, used to be more like a city, but now it's more like agriculture large fields, large open areas, not very many people. This is where Abram lived. But Lot chose, it says, to pitch his tent towards Sodom, a land filled with evil, a land filled with men who were burning up inside with unnatural sexual desire, a land full of rape, incest, a land full of disgusting sexual immorality. But this is where he put himself. This is where he faced his tent towards Sodom. We learn here that the direction determines your destiny. What you put in front of you directs where you will go. The Bible tells us, it says, guard your heart above all things, for out of it flows the wellspring of life. Where you put your face is where your heart will go. I want to ask you this morning to search your heart. What is your heart like? What's in front of you? What do you look at? What are you pursuing? See, Abram could have easily chosen Sodom. And if he was only looking to fulfill the dream that God had put in front of him, he probably would have chosen Sodom. But Abram understood that he could not compromise for the sake of the dream. For some of you young people here this morning, taking a step out into a new life, heading off to college, some of you are heading off to high school, some of you are just heading off into summer. Remember this, the direction that you point your face will determine the destiny on your life. For you adults in the room, facing a fork in the road, making a life change, remember this. The direction 
of your face determines your destiny. Never choose to compromise to fulfill the dream in your heart. Never choose to give in to the easy way of life just because it'll fulfill the dream inside of your heart, in your mind's eye. Always choose to search for God before you search for your dream. Always choose to please God before you satisfy your dream. You know, the Bible tells us that our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. And if the only thing that we're searching for is to fulfill the dream of our heart, it is so easy for us to choose a path that will lead us to compromise. It is obvious. So we read later in Scripture, in 2 Peter, we are told that Lot was a righteous man. But he was a righteous man who at times, just like you and me, struggle with fulfilling the passions, the sinful passions of our heart. How are we guarding our heart? It is the wellspring of life. How are we guarding our heart? Never compromise for the sake of your dream. It's so easy, though. It's so easy to give in. It's so easy to look and say, but it looks so good. But it'll take me where I've always wanted to go. You know, if we keep reading in Genesis, we find that Lot... He lived in Sodom, pitched his tent looking that direction. And Sodom was taken captive and lot with it all of his possessions, the Bible tells us, were taken. It took Abraham and his 300 men to rescue Lot. See, when we search and life to simply fulfill our dreams and forget our God. It never ceases to lead us to captivity. As pastor tells us frequently, we don't get to choose how far it'll take us or how long it will keep us there. We lose control of our life. I'm never one to tell you not to seek your dreams. I'm never one to tell you to give up on your dreams. I'm simply reminding you, seek first the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 6, and all of these things will be added unto you. Sir, seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first to please your God. Seek first the one who gave you the dream, and he will lead you to the fulfillment of your dream. Folks, we have a carnal mind. We have a heart that is easily deceived by greed, by lust. The Bible tells us there are three root sins of man. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And these so easily deceive us. Seek God first. Seek the one who gave you the dream. As you head out of here, seek to please the Lord Jesus Christ above all things. The second thing that we see in this short little passage of scripture, and it's found when Abram tells us through this short story that we are being shared with, he said, let's part company. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. Let's part company. A short little passage of scripture, just a part of a verse that we could so easily look over, but we need to stop and pay attention. There are times when we need to separate so that we can unite. There are times we need to separate when we need so that we can unite. Your friends will define your future. Who you hang out with will define your future. 
Who you choose to link yourself to will define the future of your life. There are times when we need to separate so that we can unite. You know, it's interesting. The meaning of Sodom means to burn. I mean, isn't that unique? If you keep reading in Scripture, you'll find out that it was toasted by God. The wickedness became so great. The Bible tells us that God rained down sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah, and it was toasted. It means to burn. You know where Adam chose to make his home? It means to unite. Adam had to separate himself so that he could unite himself with the passion of God's heart. The Bible warns us in the book of Proverbs Chapter 13, verse 20, it says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools will suffer harm. Let's ask ourselves this question this morning. Who are we united with? Who are the close friends around your life? Who are you choosing to spend the majority of your time with? Who is your influence? Because they will be the ones that determine your future. They are the ones that will determine the way that your mind thinks, the way that your heart feels, and the willpower that you have. Because who we hang around with become the influence, the number one influence in our life. You know, it's interesting in marriage. We become like our wives. We become like our husbands. It's weird. When I first met Stella, I never ate vegetables. I hated salad. This stuff was disgusting to me. It's a waste of time. Let's just go for a big juicy hamburger, right? It's much better. But you know, we've been married now for 14 years. And I love salad. And I love vegetables. And I love watching cheesy little girl flicks I sat down the other day when we were watching Tinkerbell I'm like there is something wrong with this picture my man card was revoked but isn't it unique that when we hang around people we begin to share like passions we begin to share idiosyncrasies just get me around a, you know someone from Florida and I'll start talking with you know a weird twang it's like what in the world is wrong with this picture it was a while back I had the privilege of heading out to, to Seattle for it youth pastors conference this was last year and I'm packing my bags and I arrive and all these guys they got their shirts buttoned up to here and this awesome haircut and they got their skinny jeans and these cool you know boots and I show up in my flannel and I'm like what in the world is going on (laughs) hello I live in Hermiston you become like Hermiston I was like I need to go you know two days later I'm like in the bathroom like tweezing my eyebrows you know it's What's wrong with this picture? The key is, is that you become like the people that you hang out with. Abram had a call from God. He had a mission from God. He had a destiny on his life, much like you. The Bible tells us, I love this passage of scripture, I quote it all the time, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Folks, do not ever forget, before you were ever born on this earth, God had a plan on your life. Be careful who you hang out with. 
Be careful who your friends are. Be careful what you surround yourself with. Because who you surround yourself with will define who you become. Think of the future of our life if Abram would have chosen to make his home in Sodom and not Lot. Think of that. This man is talked about all throughout scripture. His name is salt and peppered throughout everything. But what will happen to the future? What will happen to our young people? What will happen to Fusion Youth Group? What will happen to the future of Hermiston? If we, as the mothers and the fathers and the adults and the influences in these lives' children... Do not protect the future and the destiny on our life. What will happen if we carelessly live our life, ignoring the impact that those around us have on our life? What will happen if we do not protect what we put in front of our face, what we put in front of our heart, what we put in our lap? What will happen if we don't protect it? Because friends, I'm telling you, the direction that you point your life will determine the destiny that you arrive at. Again, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. I want to challenge us this morning. You are the foundation for the next generation. You're not here forever. That day will once come when we all get to heaven and we get to live and worship our God eternally. But for now, there is a lease on your life and it runs out. You are the foundation for the next generation. Your ceiling will become their floor. They will stand on the shoulders of the great men and women who reside in this church 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now they will be a reflection of you and I remember when I first had kids my dad told me he said Aaron be careful because what you do in moderation your kids will do in excess let me tell you what you allow in your life what you allow inside of this church the behavior the worship The tolerance that you allow in your life will be tolerated and acted out in excess in the years to come. You have a destiny. You have a call from God. You are sent out on a mission. You do not necessarily know where it will take you. But from this moment on, you are facing a fork in the road. What you tolerate is what you teach. A great word from our friend in the house, Rod Bregado, told me once day, Aaron, what you tolerate, you will teach. What do you want to teach the generation that is coming up after you? What you tolerate, you will teach. Guard your heart. Guard your eyes. Guard your tongue. And guard the men and the women that you allow to be close in your life because it will define your future. It will dictate your destiny and the ones coming after you will do it in excess. We are the byproduct of a great man whose name was Abraham and he chose to guard his heart. He chose to guard his future. He chose to guard above all things what he allowed 
in his heart. And we are the byproduct of that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you that from this moment on, from this moment on, Lord, we become aware. Lord, from this moment on, we become responsible. Lord, from this moment on, Lord, we choose to take our life and place it in your hands. Just as Abraham stepped out without a heading, without knowing where he was going to go, knowing some of the skeleton of what his future may be, but not really having a detailed description, Lord, he still went out and made a choice based on a sketchy image of what you had in his future. And Lord, when he came to that fork in the road, God, he chose wisely. God, he chose to make his home in a declining, depopulating area. God, a place with wide open fields, not necessarily great property for becoming a great nation. And God, even though Sarah could not bear children, he still believed that you would make him a great nation. God, I pray that this morning we could as well, even without seeing the future, believe that you have a great destiny in our life and choose wisely.